Welcome to the fourth Sunday of Lent. And I don't know about you, but I tell you one thing, this is a beautiful morning. Yes, it is. This is the day that the Lord will rejoice and be glad in, that is for sure. If you are able, please stand and we make our way for confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and our truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, I confess I am an act of sin and am not free of myself. I am sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what I have done and by what I have heard with my heart. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I am not with my neighbors but as myself. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Forgive me, renew me, and lead me, so that I may align with your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of the Holy God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, He gives us the power to become the children of God and bestow on us the Holy Spirit. Amen.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. And peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace, for love, and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. First lesson today comes from Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. From Mount forth the Israelites set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and, Moses, and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of, the, out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water. And we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many men Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent. And set it upon a pole, and everyone who is bidden shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole. And whenever a serpent bid someone, that person looked at, would look at the serpent of bronze and live. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We will read a response to Psalm 107. Give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good. For God's mercy endures forever. Let, Let the redeemed of the Lord proclaim that God redeemed them from the hand of the whole. Gather them in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some of the fools who took their belly's past, through their sins and they were afflicted. They loathed all manner of food. And drew near to death's door. Then they were troubled and cried to the Lord, and he delivered them from their distress. You sent, you sent forth your word and healed them, and rescued them from the grave. Let me give thanks to you, Lord, for your steadfast love, and your wonderful words for all the people. Let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving, and tell of your deeds with shouts of joy. Second reading comes from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. You were dead through the trespasses and sins, and when you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the, the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we, were, and we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace we have been saved. 
and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places of Christ, in Christ Jesus. So that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable measures of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
In many circles, John 3.16 has become a shorthand for the Christian faith. People will carry signs and read John 3.16 to sporting events, or put John 3.16 on their license plate, or on their coffee cups. This verse is so famous, everybody knows what you're talking about. Everybody knows what you mean. Or do they? Yes, most people, certainly most Christians, know John 3.16. We agree about what it says, but do we agree about what it means? John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that whosoever believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. For Christians, the, for the Christians who put John 3.16 on billboards and license plates, and signs at sporting events, I think this verse is meant as a warning, or maybe even a threat. The emphasis on everyone who believes in him. In other words, you had better believe in Jesus, or else you will perish. Carolyn I. Lewis, a Bible scholar and John expert, puts it this way. John 3.16 has in our general parlance become that which justifies damnation or unbelievers. Yes, God will save you if you believe in Jesus, but if you don't, look out. You see, this is what happens when we take famous Bible verses or anything out of context. When we read John 3.16 by itself, it sounds like a theological formula for salvation. Believe in Jesus, get eternal life, don't believe in Jesus, and you will be damned. But John 3.16 doesn't exist in isolation. And we can't read John 3.16 without also reading John 3.17. How many of you know John 3.17 by heart? It's probably worth memorizing. It goes like this. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, and yet, that's exactly what we use John 3.16 to do. Too many Christians use John 3.16 to condemn those who don't believe in Jesus Christ or don't believe in Jesus the right way. God did not send the Son in the world to condemn the world. No, God sent the Son in the world in order that the world might be saved through him. Notice that it doesn't say in order that believers might be saved or in order that the baptized might be saved, or in order that regular churchgoers might be saved, God's intention was to save the whole world, all of it, all of us. John 3.16 means John 3.17. These verses need to be read together and read in context. Listen again to John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have an everlasting life. Indeed, God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. God loved the world. God loves the world. So much that God sent his Son to bring salvation to the whole world. Not to condemn, not to damn, not to punish, but in order that the world might be saved. If you're going to use John 3 to come up with a theory of salvation, the conclusion you should come up with should be God saves the whole world. Not only believers can be saved. But even then, we might be missing the context of these verses. Because ultimately, I don't think John 3.16 and 17 can be used to make an abstract theological argument at least not without considering the particulars too. What is meant in this, Jesus, or the Gospel writer, says these words in response to a particular conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus, the Pharisee. Nicodemus comes to Jesus under cover of darkness, trying to understand who Jesus is, what Jesus represents. Jesus tells him, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. And poor Nicodemus doesn't get it. He doesn't understand what Jesus means. He gets stuck on the idea of a 
growing up, crawling back into the womb and being born again. Jesus seems to get exasperated. Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? But here's the thing. God so loved the world. God so loved Nicodemus, the Pharisee, that God sent his son. The universal truth has to be seen through the particulars. God loved Nicodemus, who didn't understand. God loved Nicodemus, who will return at the end of the story to help give Jesus the proper burial. Next week, we will hear the story of Jesus in covering the Samaritan woman at the well. Again, Jesus will have a conversation with someone who wants to understand, but maybe doesn't quite get it. And the message of John 3 will still be true. God loved the world. God loved the unnamed Samaritan woman just as much as God loved the Pharisee and the Jesus. And God sent his son to save both of them, along with the whole world. John 3, 16 and 17 make a powerful theological statement. But theology separated can't be from the, from the, cannot be separated from the particulars. Our faith can't be separated from our real lives. When we say God so loved the world, we're not talking about something abstract. I heard John 3.16 preached many times in my youth and several times since. Seldom did I hear it without a major dose of condemnation representative or reminiscent of Jonathan Edwards' famous sermon. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. Somehow they missed this part about God not condemning us. Or if they heard it, it they shifted into talking about something we had to do in order to get saved. The second problem with the accept Jesus interpretation of John 3.16, it assumes that we believe in something cognitive and logical, like I believe 2 plus 2 is 4, or I believe that H2O is a chemical symbol for water. In this text, to believe in is more like to trust or to rely upon than it is to understand the facts of all. It is a relational term akin to I believe in my family or I believe in my country. Mr. McBeebe is one of my favorite episodes of the Andy Griffith Show. Modern viewers will have to suspend judgment about smoking, little boys alone in the woods, and talking to and accepting gifts from strangers. Little Opie is playing in the woods and he strikes up a friendship with the tall, grumpy lineman working among the trees. Mr. McBeebe is a jobby O'Shore who makes smoke come out of his ears, jangles because of his tool belt, and climbs up and down to work on the lines. He entertains Opie with a few simple tricks, gives him a hatchet, and then climbs back up the pole. When Opie's father asks where he got the hatchet, he tells him the truth. Mr. McBeebe gave it to me. He then proceeds to tell about the man who walks in trees, jangles when he walks, and blows smoke out of his ears. Much discussion and melodrama ensued, in which the adults tried to decide if Opie should be forced to tell the truth or be allowed to continue in his fantasy with his imaginary friend. There is a solemn tear jerking scene between Andy and Opie in which Opie cries, don't you believe me, Carl? And Andy looks at him and says, yes, I believe you, son. Later, Barney complains, you don't actually believe this, Mr. McBeebe, do you? And Andy says, no, no, I don't. But I do believe in my son. I believe in Opie. It's a second sort of relational, trusting, relying belief that John is talking about here. A belief that doesn't yet have all the facts, that hasn't yet figured out all the theology, that hasn't yet worked all the ways and wherefores, but yet has been able to trust in the promise of God to exact and save the world, the world that God created and loves. All too often we turn this belief, this trust, this reliance into an if-then proposition. We say, if you obey God, then God will love you. If you give tithes and offerings, then God will bless you. If you accept Jesus, then God will save you. That's backwards. 
The story of God contained in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is that God has acted first to save us and afterward we respond to having been saved. It's a because therefore, not an if then equation. For God so loved the world, God sent his son. Because God so loved the world, because God sent his son. Because that son died upon the cross. Because God raised Jesus on the third day. Because all of this, we have already been saved. Because, therefore, not if then. As Ephesians 2.8 says, For by the grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Therefore, as a response to this gift, we believe on, rely on, trust, and faith in Jesus Christ. We respond to God with faith and action of our own, being made alive in Christ, trusting God's love and presence in our lives. Created in Christ, Jesus for good works, which God prepared for us beforehand to be our way of life. God acts first. We respond with love and action. A pastor living in the rural south was occasionally asked, Brother, are you saved? When he says yes, they usually want to know when. A few years ago, a friend told him what I think is a perfect answer to the when question. 2,000 years ago, on a hill and a cross outside Jerusalem. But I only found out about it a few years back. We are God's beloved children, and we were saved long ago. We are invited this day to trust that salvation anew and live each day in the hope and security of that love. God so loved the world that he sent his only son in order that the world might be saved through him. God so loved the whole world, loved the Pharisee who questioned Jesus in the dark of the night, and the Samaritan woman who questioned Jesus in the noon day, loved the man paralyzed his entire life, and the man born blind, loved Peter who denied, and Jesus who betrayed, and Judas who betrayed. God so loved the whole world, loved us sitting in the pews here today, loved our families, our friends, our neighbors. Love the people who used to come to church, but don't anymore. Love the people who were hurt by the church or lost their faith. Love the people who have never darkened the door of a church. Love the people who are hungry and the people who feed the hungry. And the people who don't care about the hungry as much as they should. Love our brothers and sisters who are Jewish, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, Sikh, and not on the provision that they accept Jesus as a person. Lord and Savior. God loves all of us. All of us. This isn't just some abstract theological concept. This is personal, individual, real, and concrete. Jesus Christ lived and died because God loves us. Because God loved our next door neighbor and our worst enemy and all people we we'll never have a chance to meet. When you quote John 3, 16 and 17, when you recite the words, God so loved the world, remember that it's personal and it's universal. God loves the whole world and God loves us and God saves all of it. For, for by grace we have been saved through faith and it's not by our doing, it is the gift of God. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Indeed, God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved to him. Amen.
Prayer response to hear, so God is your mercy is great. Trusting in God's promise to reconcile all things, let us pray for the church, the well being of creation, and a world in need. Gracious God, you love you unites. Give vision to the global church and foster cooperation and mission. Increase interreligious understanding and ecumenical dialogue. Make your church a sanctuary for all fleeing persecution, disaster, and war, especially in Ukraine and in the Middle East. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy, mercy is great. great. Creating God, your love enlightens. Restore balance to the earth's fragile habitat. Preserve wilderness lands, rainforests, and wildfire, or wildlife. Cleanse the oceans and rivers. Make us good stewards of the earth. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Righteous God, your love liberates. We give thanks for those who courageously witness to your liberating love. Especially here at Tubman and Soldier, Soldier of Truth Renewals of the Society, whom we commemorate today. Free all people from the evils of racism, religious strife, and hatred. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Merciful God, your love heals. Care tenderly for all whose loved ones perish from pandemic, disease, and every nation. Strengthen health care workers, first responders, and caregivers. Relieve all who live with chronic illness and pain. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy, mercy is great. great. Incarnate God, your love and mightiness. Open our hearts and minds to fresh understandings of our faith. Deepen our love for you and for one another. Teach us to pray for our enemies. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Abiding in God, your love saves. Those who died in the faith are made alive in Christ. <coughs> we give thanks for your promise that we also will be raised to newness of life. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Accompany us on our journey, God of grace, and receive the prayers of our hearts through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Let us pray. Merciful God, we cry out for the hope and healing you offer. Guide us continually through your service. Make us your hands to feed the hungry and prepare us to receive the bread of life. Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. And now we continue with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those of us who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy kingdom, and the power, and the glory, 
us to live and serve like Christ. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. At this time, are there any announcements? Then the Bible Baptist preaches Tuesday morning, five a.m. Okay. B Y O B. Nine on bread <laughs> and bacon. <laughs>
Thank you, sir. Thank you.